Uh, I want to take you a couple of years back to my first year of engineering. Uh, I was back at the Technical University of Denmark, and uh, we were tasked with the assignment of trying to look, design a building and look at the environmental impact on that building. And so I, I did a lot of research, and a lot of that research came back um, with information about how the construction industry is impacting the environment through greenhouse gases and through especially uh, carbon dioxide. So I thought to myself, wouldn't it be a great idea if we can invent a machine that would suck all the carbon out of the atmosphere, capsule it within that machine, and then maybe give us some oxygen back so we can breathe better. And we would do that without any input from energy, and it would be completely based on solar power. I quickly realized, however, that Mother Nature has a patent on this particular machine. To me, to understand this product, it was a no-brainer to move to Canada. Um, in Canada, as you can see here in the green box, this is the landmass of Canada. It's vast. Half of that is actually forest. And about one-third of that is forest that we manage. And how we manage the forest is extremely important. Um, if you look at the Canadian forest, you'll see that 95% of the managed forest is actually certified forest. What does that mean? It means that there are rules and regulation in place as to how we can actually harvest the trees and how we can regenerate the forest again. Approximately 1% of that is actually trees or lumber that we cut from that working trees. Well, you can say it doesn't matter how little that percentage is. If we don't regenerate the forest, it doesn't really matter. Where actually we let the forest itself regenerate itself for part of that, but we also seed half a billion seedlings every single year in order to regenerate the forest. So in the last couple of decades, we've had an increase in the amount of forest that we have in Canada and not a decrease. Another very important aspect about the tree is if we actually cut the tree or if the tree dies uh, and it rots in the forest or if we cut it and bring it in for fuel, in both cases, the tree will release back that carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. The only way we can capture that carbon dioxide is by cutting the tree and making it into useful product, for example, by putting it into a structure. Um, you guys, most of you live in single family homes here in North America. If you take a typical North American a single family home, and you look at how much carbon is there inside that home. The wood inside the home have captured approximately 25 to 30 tons of carbon in there. And that translates roughly to five years of emission of a family car. Now, I remember landing in Canada and going to Stanley Park and looking up. This is the first picture I took of Stanley Park. And to me, it was almost a no brainer that thousands of years ago, humankind looked up there and said, sure, I could use this for shelter. And they walked around picking up branches like this, looking at the flexibility of the material, looking at the strength of the material, and basically trying to investigate how they can build structures out of this material. Now, the evolution that has happened after that is quite interesting. If you go back approximately 1,000 years ago, which is represented in this building, we were able to build buildings that are roughly 50 or 60 meters in height, 30 to 40 meters in diameter, purely out of wood. This building has been standing there, and it's still standing thousands of years after. Now, the thing is, this building, this, this is a building in China, it's a temple, there are temples in Japan and other places that are in regions that are highly seismic, where there's earthquake, has been exposed to multiple earthquakes, and they're still standing there. Now, you'll think, well, that's interesting, because if that happened a thousand years ago, what are we able to do today? And so I'm putting a question mark as to what the development have been. Um, I can uh, gladly report back to you that humankind discovered clothing. But in terms of products, we no longer have to look at a piece of two by four and build all our buildings out of this piece of two by four. We have taken this fiber, removed some of the defects, reconstituted the fiber in a way, crisscrossed it in different directions to enhance some of this, its ability, produced product, engineered wood product that can allow us to build much larger, have larger span, and so on. 
even the connection that connect these pieces together, uh, which typical connection would be nail connection or a screw connection as you'll see here. So to you, this is a typical screw, right? In modern day timber engineering, this is not a screw. This is a screw. We don't have to limit ourselves to this type of connection. We have an array of connection that would allow us to build completely different building than, than what we've been doing so far. Now that's interesting because when we look at the last couple of decades, not only did we not progress, not only did we not evolve, we've actually taken a couple of steps back. Now there's a couple of reasons for that and one of the main reason is actually education. Education, educating the public, educating the students, educating the engineers. But there's two other aspects that I would like to highlight today. One of them is the regulations that we adhere to in our design, the building codes. So in Canada, we are only allowed to build out of wood up to four stories. There's a, an actual limit written in the code that does not allow us to, in, in, allow us to exceed or to go beyond that limit. Now, if you go to the province of British Columbia, for example, they've tried to push that envelope a little bit more so they can build up to six story. Uh, other countries in uh, Europe and other places have also pushed the envelope a little bit. But there are actually countries that do not have a limit at all. This is what we call performance-based design. What does that mean? Well, it means that the code set out a performance, and if that material, regardless of what it's called, meets that performance, then we're good to go. If it doesn't, it doesn't. That doesn't mean we're gonna build 200 story buildings out of wood tomorrow. It just means it allows us to innovate. And to put this for you in, in perspective as to what I was talking about before, 1,000 years ago, we were able to build buildings that were roughly four to five times the height we are allowed to build with today. Now, the other obstacle is our mentality. If you ask an engineer today, based on his education and experience, um, if you're gonna build a tall building, what would you build it with? Well, let's say concrete or steel. So you go to the, the, to the material first and not really what system, what combination of material uh, is he going to use. And there's a lot of discussion about if wood enters this area, then it will be a replacement, it will be an alternative to concrete and steel. It doesn't have to, to, to be, I, I don't really see it that way. I really see it as an added dimension to this. I really see it as more tools in our toolbox. I see it more as opportunities. And if someone, whether it's a designer, an end user, or whatever, uh, have an issue, have a, a, an actual attachment to a name of a material, here's my proposal. I propose that we don't call them by their names, we call them material X, Y, and Z and simply focus on their attributes. When we focus on their attribute, we can pick and choose the right attribute for the right job and create a system that's a combination of different materials that will give us an optimized design. Whatever that optimized solution or optimized design is, it will meet our needs. Now, there are several examples of this and I, I don't wanna bore you. I have two examples that I'm hoping will be clear to you. The first one is a floor. So this floor consists of the three materials, wood, concrete, and steel. And so wo the wood is there to reduce the weight of the floor. Uh, in the case on the left here, you see that the weight has actually been reduced to about half of what it would have been if it was concrete. Now, half of the weight in an earthquake zone is also half of the load. Well, that's great. Well, the concrete is there to actually stiffen the floor so we can span the span that we want without feeling the vibration of the floor. And the steel is there to take some of the forces that wood and concrete cannot take and also to connect the materials together. We now have a composite material that would perform much better than any of the other materials would do on their own. Here's another example, just to simplify things. If you take a truss and you put some loading on the roof, you'll have compression at the top, tension at the bottom. Well, wood is great in compression, so we would put wood on the compression side. Steel is great in tension, we would put steel on the tension side. And now we have a system that works so well, that spans the span that we want, and consists of a minimal amount of material. Now, the race is on everywhere else in the world that allows for innovation. Let me show you a very uh, quick examples here. This one is from the UK, as mentioned before, there's no limit in the UK. So one of the first 
structures that came out that was a nine-story timber building uh, is the one I'm showing here. What's really interesting about this building is, and, and some of the other buildings is, they have really not forgotten to think about the environment at the same time, minimize the amount of waste, think about the amount of material that we're actually using in our structure. In this case, it's very impressive that it's a nine-story building. What's impressive to me is at the time they reached the ninth story in this building, this is the amount of waste that was generated. You could literally put that waste in one wheelbarrow. Closer to home, you see we have several examples. This is an iconic building. You may recognize it from the uh, 2010 Winter Olympic in, uh, in BC. So this is the Richmond Oval. And you see these are timber wooden arches that are stretching over 100 meters. Well, that's impressive, right? Well, in addition to that, I really want you to think about those small panels that are connecting between the arches. Those panels are made from small dimension lumber that are nailed together. This system is multifunctional. It will span 41 feet, even though it's made out of two by fours. So it's structural. It's also acoustic due to the way it's, it's, it's done. You can run all the wiring through it. So it's multifunctional in that sense. But what's really impressive about the system is that all the lumber that's in that system comes from mountain pine beetle killed trees. What does that mean? Well, it means these trees have been affected by the mountain pine, pine beetle. The mountain pine beetle does not affect the capacity of the wood. What it does is it discolors the wood. If we left the trees out there to die and to release all that carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere, that would be a bad thing. What we did instead is we collected all that wood, put it into this building. There's about one million board feet of lumber in this building sequestering a lot of carbon. <clears throat> Just a final note, because I'm, I'm working here at the university in, in civil engineering and I'm doing a lot of uh, research. I'm also collaborating with a lot of other universities. Currently, there's 14 universities across Canada in a network working together, trying to produce systems that are multifunctional. So we're attacking this from different disciplines and we're trying to get systems that may consist of timber by itself or may consist of timber hybrids. But essentially, these systems will be multifunctional. What that means is we're not only focusing on the structural side, we're not only focusing on the serviceability side, but fire, uh, uh, durability, impact on the environment, and so on. And so uh, I just want to end up with these examples that th these are just concepts of building that have been proposed from across the, the, the uh, world. And so the one here you see is from Europe, from Norway, and then we have from Canada and also from the US. And these concepts are trying really to push the envelope, push the limits, trying to build buildings or, or, or design buildings that are 20 stories in height, 30 stories, 40 stories, or even more made from timber or timber hybrid uh, materials. And so this is great. The thing is, if I had presented this concept five, five or seven years ago, the concept itself would have been ridiculed and people sitting around would say, this is not possible, this is not attainable. Well, not only is it possible and needed, it's also a good idea. Thank you very much.